They kept letters secret from you for a long time, huh? A long time. It wasn't just a few weeks. It wasn't just a few months. It was two years. Wow. I don't think I realized that. Yeah, because they probably didn't tell you that. Boy, that's a hard place to be, to have to make a choice like that. I mean, for you. And it feels like as long as there's this power thing happening over those letters, it doesn't let any of you have the chance to actually deal with it. Like, deal with what happens next. Do you see her? Do you not see her? Do you... I don't know. What do you think it would be? I can be unadopted. Hmm. I think. I think it'd be pretty hard to be unadopted at this point. No. It's possible. Okay, so let's say you get unadopted. Where do you go? Somewhere else. Hmm. That's a plan. You got to be in a lot of pain to want to give up a home. I don't know, I guess I'm wondering if you can imagine any scenario in which you could give a little. Give a little what? Bend just a little. Be open to talking to your adoptive parents, to trying to make it less rotten right now. And why should I trust them? I'm not saying you should. Trust is a hard thing to earn. And they did some things that messed with it pretty big time. My guess is they did it with good intentions, but that doesn't make it less of a betrayal of trust. So I don't think you should just hand your trust over. I think they probably need to earn it back from you. But it's only going to happen if you give them a chance to earn it back. I guess so. I know it's a big ask. I think... I think your adopted mom is probably pretty willing to do some work with you. I don't know yet what that would look like, but we might be able to figure it out. But you'd have to be willing to. Boy, when I learned that uh, Gabrielle's parents had held back letters for two years, I was really taken aback. I had not realized that the letters were hidden from her for that length of time. And it felt like a long time to hold a secret from her. It was a really uh, tricky position when she talked about the fact that the letters had been coming for two years because I found myself really pulling for her to see those letters and trying to hold that balance between the decision making I imagine her adoptive parents must have had, but that wasn't what mattered in the room at that point. Uh, I just wanted her to get to read those letters. Um, and that was without knowing her at all and not knowing what was in the letters and what the content was and how it would affect her, but it was impressive to me that uh, her biological mother kept sending them over such a long period of time. I found myself not wanting to jump right into pushing for a meeting between Gabrielle and her adoptive mom or her adoptive parents right away um, because I had very little sense of the dynamic between them. I, when I first meet uh, a 
young woman and I don't know her at all and I don't know her parents at all and I don't know how safe or comfortable or productive that kind of a meeting is going to be. But it felt in this session like we were trying to solve a problem here that existed somewhere else and like we just weren't going to get very far talking just me to Gabrielle unless her mom was in the room with us. I found myself feeling uh, anxious um, about uh, what those letters might bring out. Now, of course, at this point, all the affect that's coming up is about not having the opportunity to read the letters. And in some ways, what we imagine and what we anticipate is uh, potentially so much more than what is. But I couldn't imagine any scenario in which reading you know, and I don't know how frequently they came, but two years worth of letters from someone who you loved and you lost wouldn't bring up a tremendous amount of emotion. And I think that Gabrielle is someone who has managed her life by protecting herself from emotion and from relationships. And so having um, that sort of inundation in emotion and experience without anything to help her with that you know she'd survive it she survived a lot but boy it would be nicer for her to have some support in it I just feel really done with it I feel really done with the tutoring, and I feel really done with therapy. Okay, so both of these things are feeling like, ugh, I, I have to go, or your, your parents, are your parents making you go to the, the tutor too? Yeah. Or is, okay. Well, because they think that I'm going to start doing better if I keep going to the tutor, but it's like I started doing a little bit worse, and then I got the tutor, and then the more and more they pressured me to do that, like I just kept doing worse. and. Like, all these things aren't helping, so I think I might as well just not do them anymore. So you're ready to be, to pull the plug on the, the tutoring for sure, and you know, possibly here, and we'll certainly go with what feels right to you. Uh, I, I want you to have a voice in, in all of these decisions. You know, not just, you know, the parents saying, okay, you have to go down here. So certainly if we need to ramp down here, I'm. I'm good with that, and I'm happy to work with you on that. Is it mostly your parents, or? A lot of it is my parents, but I would say, like, my tutor makes things pretty bad, too. How does she do that? She's just kind of like, Too, too personal. How, how do you mean? Um, that stuff that a tutor shouldn't do. Um, my last session, she she actually put her hands on me. I told her to stop, but she kind of took my whole backpack off my bed, and then she sat down beside me and started asking how I felt about girls, and then she was rubbing my back, and after that, um, she just, like, had both of her hands, like, one of them was on my leg and the other was on my back, and she was just rubbing my back, and then she told me that I'd have to see what it was like with her um, so that I could understand if I liked girls, and, um, 
having sex with girls. And I just shut down and I told her to stop it. And that I just, I didn't want it anymore. And then I got off the bed and I walked across the room and I said, I don't like this. Right. But then she told me that it wasn't a weird situation and that I was not allowed to tell anybody about it. Um, and I'm really scared that if I do tell anybody about it, she might reveal some other stuff that she's gotten me to say to her that um, I'm just not ready to be out there. And I feel like she really has me trapped. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Um, that I, I can see why you would feel trapped and confused and maybe even panicked about what's going on. Does it, is it clear to you that this is, this is an abusive situation? Does it, does that register with you? I know, I know. You know, as I think back on this session, there's a couple of opportunities that I did take and some that I didn't take. Um, ones that I did, you know, I think, uh, you know, when he first came in and he's saying, okay, I'm done here, uh, I, I, I went with that. I thought that was important, you know, and, and, and moving to the theme about, you know, it's important that he has his voice and that he can you know, say what he, what he wants uh, outside of his life, but certainly here in the session. So I thought that was a good direction. Well, you know, I, it took me a while to adjust to the uh, the the intensity uh, to really fully fully realize how present and intense the abuse was here. And oh, I think very importantly is the way that his his worry about how that was going to play out. I think he had a sense that we were moving to somehow in order to stop the abuse in the touring situation. I'd have to speak to his parents, but I think he did have real fears about how this was going to play out. Uh, you know, when the word got out, and even in terms of personal information being uh, released. I wish I would have spent more time in the session, you know, talking perhaps about those concerns and how we can put in place safeguards uh, in terms of the conversation with his parents, but also uh, with the larger world. Is he scratching, helping you? Mm. Can we explore other ways too? So I can see that you're moving your feet. Can you feel your feet on the floor, Sam? Yeah. Can you tell me if your feet are warm or cold? Yeah. Let's try to keep on moving your feet. Keep on moving them. Yeah. Can you move your other foot? Yeah. All right. Can we breathe a little bit more? Let's do three times this time, okay? One. 
two, three, Instead of scratching, can you touch your other hand and your arm like this? How does that feel? Can you feel your other? Can you feel your wrist? Yeah. Keep breathing. You're in a safe place, Sam. Nobody's trying to hurt you here. Okay. I like this. Do you feel that your body likes it? Likes when you try to soothe yourself like that. How does it feel? Nice. Nice. Obviously, Samantha came with great strengths, right? She was a good athlete. She was a, she is a wonderful student. So, you know, I really wanted to use those strengths in order to help her overcome this terrible event that happened to her. That was one of the pieces that I really wanted to make sure that I could use even in the first session so you can help us in the other sessions that could be a little bit tougher than the first one. When Samantha began to suck her thumb, um, first I thought, you know, clearly I'm, I'm triggering her. Um, this is something that she doesn't want to talk about. And I was, um, it was helpful for me to know that at least she had found some ways to cope with it, right? So I wanted to um, make, sure that, make sure that I could let her know that I, I was seeing it, that I knew that this was helping her. And I also wanted to make sure that I could at least add a few other things that she could do um, besides the sucking thumb, the sucking her thumb and, and you know, um, touching her ear. I told Samantha that I would do it with her. I would try to move my feet and also touch my arm and my hands because I wanted her to know that she wasn't doing it alone, that I could do it with her and we can do it together.